wanted to talk a little bit about uh, minimally invasive treatments for BPH and the, the shifting paradigm. I have no disclosures to, uh, to talk about. I wanted to start by introducing a few cases just to think about, and then we'll kind of go into the, the meat of the talk and come back to the cases at the end. But these are all patients of mine. The first case is a 64-year-old male. He had uh, significant uh, symptoms, IPSS score of 21, by the score of 5. He was on Tamsulosin twice a day. He also had pretty significant incomplete emptying, and so it required intermittent catheterization. As part of his workup, we performed a urodynamic test, and you can see on the right side that he does have a definitely weak, weak bladder, detrusor underactivity with incomplete emptying. So we continued his evaluation. We did an ultrasound. It showed a 63-gram prostate. And then on cystoscopy, he really had just mild bilobar enlargement, but a very large bivalve, uh, ball valve component to a median lobe. So that's one case to think about. The second patient is a 58-year-old male who initially presented to an outside hospital in urinary retention. He came to me on Tamsulosin. We did a voiding trial, which he passed, but he still had significant symptoms. And we uh, worked him up. His ultrasound showed very large prostate, 127 grams. And on cystoscopy, he had very large bilobar uh, enlargement, but no median lobe component. And the last case is a younger gentleman with significant bother. Uh, he was on Tamsulosin with some improvement, but he didn't like the side effects of dizziness and retrograde ejaculation. He had a very small prostate, <clears throat> 29 grams by ultrasound. And on cystoscopy, he had very mild bilobar enlargement, but very elevated bladder neck. So these are three different cases uh, to, to think about um, how we treat these patients. And the reason I bring these up is there have been some significant changes to the AUA guidelines over the past several years for BPH. This is the most recent update, 2021. And one of the things that the authors talk about is using IPS, IPSS symptom scores at each patient visit to really track their symptoms. They also talk about really engaging patients and discussing surgical options early on in the process, even while they're on medication, because they may be either inadequately treated or may have side effects from the medication. So letting patients know about these treatments. And one of the reasons why they talk about that is because of the uh, really prominence of two uh, minimally invasive treatments that have really come to the forefront, prostatic urethral lift and water vapor therapy. These are both indicated for prostates between 30 to 80 grams under the current AUA guidelines. Although they, they base their guidelines all on randomized trial data, they're not, it's not really consistent with some of the, the labeled indications. For example, for prostatic urethral lift, it's indicated for prostates any size up to 100 grams and to include obstructed median lobe. What I will say is that my clinical experience on these minimally invasive treatments is all with prostatic urethral lift, so I'll base most of my discussion on that therapy, but you know, I'd be happy to hear your experiences and, and some of these other therapies as well. One thing that's clear is that these minimally invasive treatments have become much more prominent over the uh, past few years. This is a recent publication that looked at Premier Healthcare database uh, utilization rates, and you can see that there's a significant increase specifically for prostatic urethral lift, particularly from 2014 to 2018, a 25-fold increase from 0.4% to 10.8% of BPH procedures, and these don't, don't even include outpatient procedures. More recently, at this year's AUA, an abstract was presented looking at the, the trends and utilization for BPH procedures, looking at uh, Medicare trends from 2014 to 2018. Once again, you can see a significant rise in the uh, prostatic urethral lift utilization. It actually, in 2018, surpassed green light with 22.4% of all BPH procedures. And one thing we noticed is that TERP has remained pretty steady in all these studies, so that's consistently the number one procedure. But uh, the prostatic urethral lift has trended higher, and actually in 2019, before the COVID pandemic, it accounted for 30% of all BPH procedures. So clearly these minimally invasive treatment options are becoming you know, much more, more prominent in, in our uh, armamentarium. And I think we should go back and look at some of the clinical trial data to see why maybe it's so accepted among urologists and patients. This is the LIFT trial, which was published in 2017. It's a randomized clinical trial that uh, 
that uh, had patients treated with either the prosthetic urethral lift or sham control, and at three months they were allowed to cross over for treatment. They followed them for five years, and you can see that there's significant improvement in symptom scores and quality of life, as well as improvements in flow rate that were pretty durable for five years. These patients saw significant improvement pretty early within two weeks of treatment and returned to their normal perioperative activity at 8.6 days, which is very important for a minimally invasive treatment. Now, there was a retreatment rate of 13.6% at five years. And the other thing is that patients, when you look at uh, sexual function, they actually had improved ejaculatory function during this trial. This is looking at water vapor therapy with Resume. This was recently published. This is their five-year uh, trial data. And it was performed similarly in, in, in somewhat similar fashion to the LIFT trial. Patients were randomized to either treatment, uh, water vapor therapy or sham control. And at three months, they were allowed to cross over. They analyzed their data a little differently. They did a per protocol analysis versus an intent to treat analysis, which uh, that, uh, when you look at randomized trials, is thought to be uh, less, uh, more likely to allow for bias to inter intercede into the trial. But they did find significant improvements, similar, you know, reductions in IPSS, improvements in flow rate and, and quality of life that were durable for five years. They uh, didn't, uh, they, they showed significant improvement at three months versus two weeks, but they did have a lower retreatment rate, 4.4% at five years compared to the 13.6%. In the guidelines, the authors talk about the high attrition rates in these studies, and they're not sure how, how that could affect the retreatment rates if, you know, these patients are lost to follow-up and not, not followed through. This was a prospective trial that compared head-to-head -head urolift or the urethral lift versus TERP. In patients with a prostate 60 grams or less, they followed them for 12 months. The 45 patients got the POL and 35 patients got the TERP. One thing you can notice on the right side is that uh, the patients that had the prosthetic urethral lift had a more rapid return to baseline activities, 11 days versus 17 days. And you can see that they also had a more rapid decrease in symptoms and um, improvement in quality of life uh, initially, but that if you look over 12 months, there was definitely a, a, a overall greater improvement with the TERP patients in flow max and in symptoms, which I think we would all expect. When you look at quality of life, they were similar. There was not a s significant difference. And that's probably because in the, uh, at least when you look at sexual function, there was an improvement in ejaculatory function with the patients that had prostatic urethral lift versus what you'd expect a decrease with the TERP. One thing they looked at, which is important for any minimally invasive treatment, is the, the rate of recovery, how, how well patients recover from procedure. And what they did was they used this visual analog scale, and they measured what they call high-quality recovery as a 70% uh, seventy percent on this scale, and if you look temporally at this uh, graph here, which measures what they call high quality recovery or seventy percent on that scale, you can see there 's a much more rapid response in the patients that had prostatic urethral lift. in other words, it took patients that had a TERP six months to achieve the same level that patients achieved after two months with the prostatic urethral lift and d during that and also during that study seventy four percent of patients that had a TERP Required, required a catheter after 24 hours versus 45% that had the prosthetic urethral lift. And retreatment rates were pretty similar after one year, 6.8% for the, for the lift versus 5.7% uh, for the TERP. This was the uh, trial, MediLift trial, prospective trial that actually led to FDA approval for a median lobe treatment for the prosthetic urethral lift. It was 45 patients that had similar baseline characteristics as the original lift trial, which was just lateral lobe treatment. They uh, obviously had mo more implants because they treated the medial lobe as well. They were followed for one year, and you can see that the symptom score improvement on IPSS was very similar to both the, the lateral lobe only and, and actually the, the combined when they look at both data sets. And actually when they look at both data sets, they combined the median lobe and the lateral lobe data compared to the, the control and they looked at what they would consider significant improvement in IPSS, which is greater than or equal to eight, there was a, a much higher incidence of achieving that with the uh, prosthetic urethral lift. It was 75% versus 34% in the control group, and this persisted up to 12 months. 
One important factor for any minimally invasive treatment is durability. We've seen some variability under retreatment rates. So this, uh, these investigators presented to AUA real world data from uh, Medicare and commercial claims analysis on the uh, rate of return procedures, which is any procedure in the office on a, a return visit outpatient setting. They also looked at rate of secondary BPH procedures, which would be any obviously BPH procedure after initial treatment. And they compared it between these four different treatments. <clears throat> they found when they looked at rate of return procedures that the prosthetic urethral lift had a much lower percentage than the other three treatments. And when they looked at the rate of secondary BPH procedures, this is a one-year follow-up, the, uh, uh, the actually the water vapor therapy had the, the highest higher rate compared to prosthetic urethral lift, 7.2% versus 5.4%. Uh, and these were pretty equivalent. So there's definitely some variability out there uh, in, that, in those rates um, and differences between sometimes what you see in trials and what you see in, in real world. This was an abstract presented at the AUA that looked at larger prostates. So they looked at the water vapor therapy and wanted to see, you know, was it as effective for large prostates as small prostates? It was a, a total, uh, uh, the majority of patients had, had what they consider smaller prostates, less than 80. But there's a fair amount, 49, that had larger prostates. What they, they followed them for an average mean of 309 days for the smaller prostates and 441 days for the larger prostates. What they found was the larger prostates had significant improvements in flow rate and reductions in PVR. They didn't see any statistical significant difference with symptom scores, whereas they saw all three categories improve with the smaller prostates. What they did find was that it was a higher rate of catheter dependence at 90 days between these groups, it was 20% in the larger prostates versus 9% uh, in the smaller prostates. It was also a much higher retreatment rate in larger prostates, 18% uh, versus 4% in smaller prostates. So at least in this, this study, larger prostates seem to predict a higher rate of retreatment. Now regarding prostatic urethral lift, rear burning colleagues at this year's AUA looked at the real world data, over 2,700 patients treated, and they wanted to look at factors that predicted retreatment, at least for this therapy. Interestingly, they didn't find that the size of the prostate or even presence of median lobe predicted retreatment. What they found was that baseline IPSS scores and quality of life seemed to predict, predict that, at least on univariate analysis. When they looked multivariate, they found that the baseline quality of life seemed to predict that. So that suggested to them that men that had worse disease states more likely to require retreatment, so that you really want to, with the, you really want to intervene earlier in these patients' disease process you know, with these therapies. One, uh, sorry, the wrong way. One other big factor is looking at sexual pre preservation after BPH treatments. And this uh, study looked at uh, all the randomized trial data on the newer BPH technology, technologies and compared it to transurethral section of the prostate. And what they found was that the prostatic urethral lift actually improved ejaculatory function you know, following treatment, whereas aqua therapy preserved it, and both the water vapor therapy and transurethral section of the prostate had decreased in ejaculatory function after treatment. And there is some variability when you look throughout the literature, at least regarding water vapor therapy. It can range anywhere from 3% to 42%. There was one study out of Mayo Clinic that showed a 20% rate of ejaculatory dysfunction, but it was all in patients that had median lobe treatment. So that may be something to consider, you know, when counseling patients, particularly if you're going to treat a median lobe, that, that that may be an issue. None of the treatments actually affected erectile function, so there was no, no change there. One important question is, does prior endoscopic therapy uh, preclude or make more difficult treatment with robotic simple prostatectomy? Because sometimes you'll treat a patient and, and they, they may need further treatment later on. So this study looked at a total of 520 patients, 87 who had had prior endoscopic therapy. They all underwent robotic simple prostatectomy. They all had similar baseline values. And what they found was there was no difference in robot consult time, estimated blood loss, 30-day uh, complication rate, or even improvements in symptom score or quality of life between both groups. So it suggested to them that it doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, affect it. Now, the one thing to take from this, at least the, the treatments we're talking about, is that out of the 87, only three had a prior prostatic urethral lift and only one had prior water vapor therapy. So obviously we need more data in these subsets to see, but this would suggest at least for uh, other endoscopic treatments that it doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, make it more complicated or have less effective treatments. 
This is my experience with prosthetic urethral lift at Baylor. It's obviously much smaller numbers than real world data or lift study, but it does show that I have, have been able to demonstrate significant, you know, rapid improvement in symptoms that at least up to 12 months has carried out. Obviously, I want to continue to follow that to see how durable it is. I will say I have treated one patient with a TURP that, that wasn't uh, effectively treated with, with the lift, um, but, uh, you know, I'm pretty happy with these results. So given, given my experience, let's go back to these cases and talk about how, we, how, how I treated them. So this first patient, he obviously had underactive detrusor. He was on intermittent catheterization. He you know, anatomically had a very obstructing ball valve like median lobe. I, I talked to the patient. I said, no matter what your treatment, whether it is, you know, we consider, in him, I would consider options, you know, continue intermittent catheterization, consider a TERP, or even possibly a prosthetic urethral lift, uh, you know, which, which I was comfortable with. He, uh, I told him that no matter what the treatment, he may still have to catheterize because of his weak bladder. He was concerned about sexual function. I told him that you know if we did a urethral lift, it wouldn't preclude further treatment with the TERP. So he decided to go ahead with the prosthetic urethral lift. We did seven implants. Two were placed in the median lobe. You can see it really pinned it to the side and really opened up a nice channel from the bladder neck to the vero. Postoperatively, he was warding well without needing to catheterize. His IPSS score went from 24 down to four and he was off his medication. So he was very, very happy with that result. The second case, 58-year-old male, very large prostate. So normally these are guys that I would consider referring to one of my colleagues to consider a robotic simple prostatectomy. He was recently married. He was very concerned with sexual function. I, I told him that his prostate size was outside, off-label for this, but I felt by dimensions on ultrasound that that I could successfully implant the, the prosthetic urethral lift, the, the urolift, and he wanted to go ahead and try that first. Uh, like, like I said, if it failed, it wouldn't, uh, he could always have a simple prostatectomy. So we went ahead, we did eight implants, really opened up a nice channel from the uh, bladder neck to the vero, and his uh, post op leaves doing real well. His IPSS score went from a 20 down to three and, and was off, also off medication. The last patient, very small prostate, so in this case, you know, I would consider doing a transurethral incision of a prostate for that high bladder neck, uh, but also even a urolift. He was, once again, concerned about sexual function, and so we did the urolift. We did four implants, really targeted placing them real anteriorly to really lift the prostatic urethra and flatten out that bladder neck. You can see how that, how that, how that looks there. Postoperatively, he's doing real well. His IPS score went from a 19 down to a 2 and he's, he's also off his medication. So three different cases, three different types of prostates, maybe not in some cases not what you'd normally consider for a minimally invasive treatment option, but uh, nonetheless, at least uh, they've done well thus far. These are some other scenarios that you may want to consider that, that, that I've treated and you may want to consider using this for. Patients that have had radiation for prostate cancer that maybe you'd be worried about inducing stress incontinence with any kind of tissue ablative therapy, I think that uh, the prosthetic urethral lift is good for that. Patients that, that I have a lot, you know, large population of that have this refractory overactive bladder, maybe neurogenic bladder that you really are, are you want to consider bladder Botox, but you're concerned with the BPH whether they'd have, you know, retention and need to intermittent catheterize. And then this last case, which is a case, combined case with Dr. Coburn, a patient of his that had a prior laser transurethral section of the prostate that developed a really recalcitrant prostatic urethral stricture. You can see here it failed multiple DVIUs and balloon dilations and office procedures. So we took him to the operating room, did a <clears throat> DVIU, and actually put in the, the, the prostatic urethral lift implants to kind of try to hold it open. He has had a second procedure for this likewise, but I think we both agree that the, that the quality of the stricture, the tissue, has improved and he's had less requirement for any balloon dilations in the office or even need to catheterize at home. So we're still following this case, but uh, just kind of an out-of-the-box you know, scenario that maybe you'd consider using this as well. What I would like to conclude is I, I like to do a lot of day hikes. I'm an avid kind of day hiker, and this is actually a, a fall summit in Mount Elbert, which is the, uh, the highest peak in the Rockies, the second highest peak in the continental U.S. And I think for me what this represents is that that only 2% you know, only of the patients on medication are actually being offered or treated with surgical therapy. So I think it's a really undertreated population. But the picture on the right it is uh, showing me on top of a half dome in Yosemite. And I think with these newer minimally invasive options, which are effective, 
they're durable and they're and they're safe. I think you know urologists can engage patients more early in the disease process and really offer these treatments that can improve their symptoms and quality of life.